Um, so without anything more, I'd like to introduce Michael Albert, who will be talking about uh, anarchist economics. Um, usually when I, when I give a talk on economic vision, it, it's a long talk, and I describe uh, first relevant values that are associated with it, then how those values um, work themselves out in an economic context, then institutions that can achieve the values, developing a whole vision. Now, I can certainly do that, and I have an outline to do that. Um, but, but I suspect that with this audience, unlike virtually every other audience I've ever talked to, that might not be the that might not be the most productive thing to do. It may be that a lot of people here are already uh, somewhat familiar with um, participatory economics, which I propose, or other economic models, and would be more interested in uh, an exchange and more, di more time for discussion. After all, we only have an hour. So let me just ask a question. How many people here are already uh, familiar enough with participatory economics, so my spending a lot of time describing its bare bones and its basic structure is not going to help them very much? Yeah, it's quite a lot. Um, uh, all right, so then let me do it quickly so that those people aren't entirely bored, and then we'll have discussion and we'll see what emerges from, from that. Um, so Anarchist Economics was the, the title. And actually, uh, in my understanding of anarchism and my understanding of participatory economics, it seems to me that it's an anarchist vision, um, an anarchist economic vision. It's not an anarchist political vision or an anarchist kinship vision or an anarchist cultural vision, but it is, I think an anarchistic, that is, it embodies anarchist values, economic vision. So I'll start from, from the point of, of anarchism, um, which I wouldn't necessarily ordinarily do, and say what, what kind of, uh, what would it mean to say that we want an economy uh, that, that embodies anarchist aims, principles, and aspirations? Well, uh, uh, certainly <clears throat> one thing that um, uh, characterizes economic life is that decisions get made. So one of the attributes or one of the values that we're going to have to have, uh, that an economy is going to have to uh, fulfill and propel, is going to be some kind of value about decisions. Uh, surely we don't want an economy which, uh, which uh, gives tremendous amount of power to a few people and very little power to many people. That would ab violate our anarchist uh, values. We need a positive value that it would get to. I'll get to the positive value in a minute. Another attribute or implication of an economic system is that it affects the relations among people. It affects the way people interact with one another. Um, we're not going to want an economy which causes people to be pitted against one another such that the advance of one is gained at the detriment of another. That's not going to be an anarchist kind of economy. We're going to want an economy which the natural operations of the economy causes people actually to have empathy for one another, to have solidarity with one another, to advance cooperatively rather than antagonistically. So that's another kind of value that we're going to want. Um, we're going to have we're going to, another aspect of economics um, is that it obviously has a tremendous impact upon what we have, our circumstances, either our circumstances at work or you know we, where we do things economically, where, where where we are engaged in economic activities, and our circumstances in the form of income. So we have to have a value about that, like equity, a value about how people are remunerated for what they do and what conditions they have. We're not going to be in favor as anarchists of an economic structure which gives the good circumstances during economic activity to a few and allots the rest to taking orders and menial labor. And we're not going to be interested in an economy which apportions income dramatically to a few and adversely to the many. Um, uh, so what's positive? Well, let's go back to decision-making. Uh, for me, a, a positive value for decision-making, you know, people write thousands of pages about this kind of stuff, but I don't think it's all that complicated. Um, uh, for me, a positive value about decision-making that anybody should hold, and that seems to me to be an anarchist value, is that people should have an input over decisions in proportion as they're affected by them. So some decisions, it makes sense to be dictatorial. How can I be saying that in an anarchist audience? Well, you know, suppose one of you is um, at a desk in a workplace, and I'm at the next desk, and you're making the, the decision is whether or not to bring in a picture of the person you live with. Well, I actually think that's a virtually a dictatorial decision. That's literal. In other words, you should make it. I should have no say in it. That makes sense because it affects you, and it doesn't affect me or anyone else really. But suppose you want to bring in a radio, put it on your desk, and play real loudly 
some kind of music that you happen to like. And the workplace would be disturbed by that. Well, now it's no longer appropriate that you have complete and sole decision-making power. Rather, it makes sense that the, people, the other people have a say. How much say? Well, a say proportionate to the degree they're affected. And we're done. We have a value. We don't have a lockstep method. We don't have one person, one vote, consensus, dictatorship. What we have is a value that people should have a say over decisions in the proportion to which they're affected by them. And it has tremendous implications for what kinds of information people have to have, what kinds of consciousness and skills people have to have, and what kinds of access to decision-making influence people have to have in different situations and around different issues. Okay, so to me that's a, a positive value. Solidarity, I think, is much simpler. Uh, economic life should cause people to um, care for and um, have solidarity, empathy with one another, rather than the reverse. To the extent that it does that, that it produces solidarity, it's better. To the extent that it produces antisocial, you know, competitiveness and egoism, it's worse. I don't think that one's very controversial, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. Um, equity, well, what should be the situation with respect to circumstances and income? Circumstances, let's leave that aside for a minute. Let's deal with the harder issue of income. Um, we could reward people for property, for a deed in their pocket. There's probably nobody in here who's confused about that. Everybody in here probably thinks that that's sort of vile. Why should Bill Gates get $100 billion because he has a piece of paper in his proper pocket that says he owns a whole lot of property, um, whether he does anything or not? Um, we could reward people for power, which is what actually happens in the United States. Really, property translates into bargaining power, as does output in the United States. So we could, we could have a Genghis Khan economy, that's what we have, in which people are rewarded for the power that they can bring to bear. They get what they can take. Right? That's a market system. Power is the determinant, bargaining power. Obviously, that's not an anarchist aim. Uh, neither is the first. Now comes the confusing part. Some people on the left think that it makes sense, and at first glance it does seem to make sense, that you should get back what you put in. That, that whatever we contribute to the, call it the economic pie, the social product, is the amount that we should get back. If we get back less than that, somebody ripped off from us, right, is the, is the thinking. And I think this is confused, because I think that when, um, let's take uh, Michael Jordan. By this norm, is he overpaid or underpaid? How many people think he's overpaid five years ago when he was playing regularly, Michael Jordan? How many people think he's underpaid? Well, by this norm, in fact, he's underpaid, dramatically underpaid. If you should get back what you put in, the fact of the matter is that our population highly, highly values what Michael Jordan put in. Michael Jordan, for those who don't know, you know, the basketball. Um, well, you know, this, this audience is unusual in many respects, and one respect is that people might not know who Michael Jordan is. Uh, so in any case, the, the society values what he puts in so much that, in fact, if you're going to give him what he outputs, let's take a different case that might be more conducive to this audience. Let's take Mozart and Salieri, two composers at the same time a long time ago. Right? If, we, if we give Mozart what he puts in, what should Mozart's heirs have now? You know, Pennsylvania, right? Something huge, or probably Germany, right? They should, in other words, he has given, Mozart gave a tremendous amount. By virtue of what? Well, sometimes the amount that we, that we put in, right, is a function of the tools we use, having better tools. Sometimes it's a function of just happening to be doing something that's more valued. Sometimes it's a function of the people we work with being very competent and capable and are being lucky in those circumstances. Sometimes we have ourselves a skill or a talent which others don't have. Right? So those things are not distributed equally. Those things are very diverse. If they weren't very diverse, what a boring world it would be. They're very diverse. So Mozart and Salieri, if they each spend four hours composing, Mozart has this pile of stuff that people are like for 400 years, and Salieri has a nice little tune that you know, is worthy to have been created, but isn't, isn't in the same league. Should we reward output or not? I think rewarding output is not an anarchist principle. Milton Friedman, people know who Milton Friedman is, the right-wing economist, Nobel Prize winner. He once confronted a bunch of leftists, and he said, look, you guys say that it shouldn't be the case that somebody, by virtue of the luck of the parents that they have, is born on third base or rounding third base, headed for home with no catcher there to tag them out, 
And somebody else is born standing at the plate, facing Nolan, I can't do that, facing a great pitcher, right, um, <laughs> holding a wiffle ball bat that has holes in it, and the pitcher is even half the distance from them, and they already have two strikes. In other words, it's not fair that some people are born working class, and some people are born with parents who are rich and who give them all this stuff. And he says, okay, fine. But now what I want to know is how come you think we should reward luck of the genetic lottery? Why should we reward people whose genetic endowment gives them some remarkable talent, some, like Mozart or like whatever it is that Michael Jordan has, which no matter how long I practice, I don't have, right? No matter how long I practice, no matter what training I go through, I can't produce what Mozart produced. So why should we reward that? Why should we reward bigger size? Suppose we're both cutting cane, two of us. One's bigger, one's smaller. We go out for four hours. We both work the same amount. We both work with the same energy. We both make the same effort and sacrifice. We come back, pile, pile. Should we give this person this much and this person this much? I think an anarchist would say no. I think an anarchist would say we should reward, and here comes the value, effort and sacrifice. We shouldn't reward power. We shouldn't report output. We shouldn't reward property. We should report, reward, remunerate, pay for what people put in in the sense of the effort and the sacrifice they expend in their work. That's an important value. If we value these things and we look at capitalism, say, or for that matter, what's called market socialism or centrally planned socialism, we have to reject them. Right? They don't reward only effort and sacrifice. They don't create circumstances of equity and circumstance at, at work. We'll get to that in a minute. They don't uh, uh, create um, uh, a decision-making input in proportion to the degree they're affected, and so on. Again, I'm going quickly because I want to um, arrive at, at the possibility of discussion rapidly. Okay, so if we have these values as anarchists, maybe you don't. But if we did, and I think it's plausible that anarchists would have these values. Um, it isn't obvious to me... Um, what one would have with respect to decision-making other than self-management, other than participatory self-management. Surely one wouldn't have consensus as the value, because if one did, then one would think that the whole workplace should be in a position to veto whether or not the person brings in a picture of their, of their mate for the, for the desk. None of us believe that. None of us really believe that every decision should be consensus. None of us really believe that every decision should be one person, one vote, or anything else. We must have some value that we're trying to implement when we choose a method. I think that value is self-management. Uh, okay, so then the task of creating an economic vision becomes how do we organize production? How do we organize consumption? How do we organize allocation, the functions of economics, institutionally, in such a way that we meet people's needs, fulfill their potentials, and propel these values, rather than propelling horrible side effects that we don't want, horrible values. Um, uh, so then we have to think about these things. So let me just give some of the institutional characteristics of what I think is, an, a, is a positive economic vision. Um, the first one let me give is, is the alternative to, or what seems to me to be the alternative to, what we can call corporate workplace organization, corporate division of labor. You can give it any name you want. What do we mean by it? Well, we mean that in the workplace... We have jobs. That's going to be true in any economy. Jobs are composed of lots of tasks. That's going to be true in any economy. So, so far, no problem. In a capitalist economy or a market socialist economy or a centrally planned socialist economy, the way tasks are put together to create a job is that we take a bunch of tasks which are comparable to one another in their empowerment effect and in their quality of life effect. So we get somebody who is a custodian or who is a secretary or who is an assembly line worker or who is a, um, a manager or a lawyer or a doctor. And what is characterized by the way the tasks are put together is that people can be fit on a, on a, on a hierarchy, on a, on, a, on a hierarchy of what? Of empowerment that their job gives them, of control that their job gives them, and of quality of life that their job gives them. And, and this hierarchy... Right? Is, is very evident and is clear. And it, it turns out to be the case, and this is rather typical, but let's take the United States, that about 20% of the people wind up getting jobs which have a lot of empowerment, a lot of control over their own circumstances and over other people's circumstances. Yes, they're still subordinate to capitalists, but they have a lot of control over their own lives and over the lives of people below them. Right? And about 80% wind up getting jobs in which they have virtually no say over anything. And in, 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 to a considerable degree, it's worse than the disenfranchisement of a citizen in a Stalinist dictatorship. 
That is to say, even in a Stalinist dictatorship, you don't have to ask to go to the bathroom. But in the workplace, you do have to ask to go to the bathroom if you're in the working class, if you're not in that 20%. That 20% basically controls that aspect of their circumstances and many, many others, as well as defining the situation of those below. So in other words, what I'm saying here is that corporate division of labor introduces a new aspect of class. It isn't just that some people own General Motors or Microsoft or Boeing, right? There are some people who own the the corporations. And as a result, they have property, and the property gives them vast power, and so they have gigantic wealth and gigantic power. True. But in addition to that, there's a division of labor which robs 80% of their humanity, of control over their lives, of dignity, of, of the opportunity to manifest their preferences in a significant portion of their life, and gives that all to 20% who monopolize the information and the levers of power. So what's the alternative to this? Well, I think the alternative to this is what I call balanced job complexes. This is not rocket science. There's nothing complicated about this. If the problem is that the tasks are apportioned in such a way that you get a monopoly of empowerment for a few and a monopoly of obedience for the many, then you have to reapportion the tasks. You have to redesign jobs so that each person has an array of responsibilities and tasks such that their circumstances are comparably empowering to other people's circumstances. When we started South End Press, we sat around with about 12 people and we said, let's have a publishing house. It's a radical publishing house. Now, let's do good books. Let's do good stuff. But let's also have it embody our values. So we said, okay, we've got to be democratic because we believe in democracy. We've got to have people control it. You know, we didn't have... And, and so we said, oh, one person, one vote. We're not going to have somebody who, you know, is the final veto power and the boss and the head or whatever. Um, but we talked about it for a while, and we realized what happens if somebody is doing the finances of South End Press, and somebody is doing, has all the contact with the authors, and somebody does the fundraising, and everybody else is typesetting and cleaning up and doing the mail and so on and so forth. And we have one person, one vote, and we really do believe in democracy. But the 12 people come into the room and sit at the table and make decisions. So we really do, I mean, nine can overrule the three. They really can, right? But will it ever happen? No, never. Even though they can, it will never happen. Why? Because they don't know what's going on. Because their circumstances are such that they don't even have opinions. Moreover, there's tremendous power vested in the fact that this person is the person who has the relations with all the authors, without which the institution dies. This person is the person who knows all the finances. So in any discussion, what they say is unchallengeable. This other person over here is the fundraiser. I'm describing to you radical institutions in the United States. Right? Radical institutions in the United States are overwhelmingly controlled, almost almost at the same degree of ultimate say by the person who either is the donor or the fundraiser. And after that, the people who have the set of jobs that I would call coordinator class type jobs, they have a lot of power and influence and stature and, you know, and, and reward from their labors. And then there's the people who go around doing all the real hard work, you know, all the work that actually is necessary, you know, and they have crap. So, um, for their labors. So the, the point here is, is balanced job complexes mean that we reconstruct all that to get rid of not just the capitalist, not just the owner who has, but to get rid of the coordinator class, to get rid of the monopolization of levers of power and of information that bears upon power and of skills and of disposition so that some people aren't totally exhausted and other people's enervated when they come together to talk about what should be done. Right? So balanced job complexes. Obviously, much more can be said about any of these things, but uh, nonetheless, it seems to me that's a very, very important um, backbone institutional attribute of a good economy. Of course, it's, and it has profound implications. Suppose we adopt a vision of an economy and one of its component features is balanced job complexes. Well, immediately there arises the question, why don't we incorporate that in our own institutions? Nothing legally prevents us from doing so. Nothing, there's no gun that prevents us, you know, there's no pressure that stops us from doing that. Same as if we, if we say that we're for multiculturalism, say, we're for feminism, we're against sexist hierarchies, we're against racist hierarchies. The question immediately rises, and it arose 30 years ago, why then in our institutions do we have the equivalent of Jim Crow relationships or the equivalent of, you know, a, a, a male locker room culture? And, and this was struggled against. 
So immediately, if we have a real economic vision, and this is part of the problem with having a real economic vision, if it's really held strongly, then the question arises, why don't we, uh, why don't we, can people in the back hear? Oh, okay. Why don't we um, uh, begin to implement it? Um, remuneration for effort and sacrifice is a second, key, a second leg upon which a good economy um, stands, it seems to me. Um, that means that if we had jobs like now, who would get the most money? You know, the surgeon or the coal miner? The coal miner would get paid more because their effort and sacrifice is greater. If we had jobs like now, it would be topsy-turvy. The people with the good, comfortable, empowering jobs would get less. The people with the onerous, debilitating, health you know, health denying, dignity denying jobs would get more because they're sacrificing more. They're, they're putting out more effort. That's what would actually happen. Now, in a, in, if you have balanced job complexes, of course, it's somewhat different because now we no longer have people who monopolize good conditions and people who have only bad conditions. Rather, we have a mix and a shared situation. So now what happens? Now we're getting paid. Com you know, we have comparable work situations, and the differential in our income is a function of, well, some people working longer or less long, or some people working harder or less hard. Um, but it's not a function of some people being surgeons and some people being, uh, you know, scrub nurses or whatever, uh, or working on an assembly line. Um, uh, once we have those two features, then we, then we, I think, need to have a feature that has typically arisen every time there has been an outpouring of working class um, and of popular dissent from oppression at, at a large scale. And that's what we might call direct democratic institutions, councils, workers' councils, or consumers' councils. Um, councils of people, a mechanism through which people can manifest their pressions, their, their preferences, develop their, their views, share their opinions, and, and participate in decision making. So, so I think that one's pretty obvious. In other words, in a workplace, you have to have, well, you have to have a worker's council, and you have to have smaller groups that are dealing with segments of the workplace. And within them, they, you then have to have modes of decision making, not just a consensus, or not just one person, one vote, or not just anything, but Rather, modes of decision-making which are appropriate to the kinds of decisions that are being made so that people's input is in proportion to the degree they're affected. Council democracy, balanced job complexes, remuneration for effort and sacrifice. The final problem is the big problem and the hard problem to talk about and the one I'm going to talk about least relatively because I want to be able to discuss, but it's, it's allocation. What, what economists tell us is that we really only have two choices. Uh, and even a lot of left economists tell us this. We can have central planning. We can have some variant of a sector of people who look at lots of information called in a variety of ways and who put forth a, a, uh, a, a plan, who put forth a, a list of instructions for what each workplace should do. And then the workplaces respond to that by indicating whether or not they could easily and possibly do it, in fact, or whether there's some confusions. And then you get back new instructions, and finally you get obe obedience. Maybe you have a few rounds of that, and you get obedience. That's central planning, in which you have a cast of characters who we'll call central planners. And then inside the firms, you have the same thing as now, the same division of labor, managers at the top, and that's who, for, who these central planners communicate with in the firms, right, in the workplaces, um, uh, in making the plan. So, so we're, we're allowed to pick that option. We put that in the column as an option to pick, the, the economists tell us. And of course, most of us don't like that option because it's authoritarian. We're right. It is authoritarian. It has lots of problems. That's one. The second option that they, pit, that they allow us to pick and that we're supposed to immediately jump at because it seems not authoritarian in the same way is markets. Right? I am what you might call a market abolitionist in the same way that people were, you know, abolitionists with respect to slavery. I think, you know, 100, 300 years from now, it's going to be the general consensus that the worst, you know, the single most damaging and worst artifact of human, of human interaction and creativity may well have been the market um, as a mode of allocation. Um, the most damaging thing that humans ever came up with and imposed on themselves may well turn out to be the market. What are its problems? Well, it would take too long, but what's a market? Buyer and seller. What's a buyer try to do? You know, 
buy cheap as much as possible. Seller, sell high as little as possible. Antagonism, right? One gets ahead at the other's loss. That's the first problem. Markets induce structurally the worst kind of individualism, the worst kind of antisocial attributes, which, of course, we see all around us. Not because it's wired into genes, but because it's produced by our circumstances. The way that Leo DeRocha, a famous uh, baseball manager, said, nice guys finish last. That's accurate. Empathy, sharing, concern for others, a degree of, of concern over pain in others. These attributes are not rewarded in a market system. They are punished in a market system. Right? They are literally punished. So nice guys finish last was his way of saying it, my way of saying it, because I'm not a baseball manager, I'm a little bit more on the left and a little bit more aggressive sometimes, is that garbage rises. Right? And that's, I think, what the case is in the United States and in an economy like this. Garbage rises. What do I mean? To rise in a market system, you have to be willing to ignore the wake. And the wake is people who have lost and suffered by your gain or to maintain and sustain your gain. uh, You can do it at any level you want. You can do it at the level of Bill Gates, but you can also do it at the level of somebody inside our institutions who has a cushy position and has more say and has more stature and status and other people who are going around cleaning up and typing, right? Any way you want to do it, to rise, you have to be to a considerable extent. There are exceptions. To a considerable extent, turned off from the impact. So garbage rises. Um, sad, but um, I think it's, it's pretty accurate, um, with exceptions here and there. Um, uh, and I lost my uh, train with that little trip. Oh, I, I, we're, we're getting to allocation. So markets. So... Um, the competitive thing. Now, the next thing is, is in this exchange, let's say it's selling a car, buying a car. The, the desires of the person buying the car are manifesting themselves in the exchange. The desires of the seller, person selling the car are manifesting themselves in the exchange. Of course, we have a problem because this person is just interested in profiting, and this person is just interested in their own personal advance, and neither one of them is concerned about or can be concerned about anybody else because they don't have any information that bears upon the effects on anybody else or any way to manifest it. But what's interesting is is that the people affected by the pollution are not part of the process. And there, the effect on them is simply excluded from the economy. It does not manifest itself in the exchange. So what happens is that a market system, another problem that it has, is that it misprices everything. Because it takes into account only the buyer and seller, but none of the external effects on people who aren't immediately the buyer and seller. That's a horrible problem uh, for this allocation system. It means that the ecology is destroyed, right, because the ecological effects are all external. But it means other things, too. So the effects on the workers in the, in the plant, right, are not the, – the capitalist doesn't give a shit, except insofar as maybe he won't have any workers because they'll all be dead, they care about that. But that's about it. So the bottom, when, how many people, you know, come out of the plant with broken arms or broken souls? Doesn't matter, right? It isn't, it doesn't go into the mix. It isn't, the bottom line is profits. The bottom line is not human well-being and development. These are features and attributes that markets have intrinsically. Um, thus, I'm a market abolitionist. There are many more, but again, it would, it would just take too long. Um, in place of markets and central planning, uh, what, what makes sense to me is, is, to, is to ask, okay, can we have an economy in which the, the, the interface between, whatever you want to call it, the dynamics between the production institutions and the people, the consumers, whether individually or collective consumers, like people consuming a park or people consuming um, health care, which is a collective consumption thing, right? So whether it's individuals or groups who are the consumers and individuals or groups who are the producers, can the interactions between them, instead of being competitive or authoritarian, markets, central planning, be cooperative? Can the in- interactions between them, instead of removing from the calculus, if you want, most of what really matters incorporate everything that really matters. Those were the guidelines that, right? Can the process, instead of producing antisocial behavior, produce solidarity? 
Can it be consistent with remuneration for effort and sacrifice, which is equitable, instead of other things which are inequitable? Can it, can, will it deliver the appropriate um, influence to people over decisions? So, for instance, the decision whether or not we should have a new, uh, a new approach to transportation. Are we going to get appropriate say in that decision which affects us? Or is it going to be decided by some elite or some narrow group or by some mistaken process even? Let's take something just for one example. In, that, in the late 1950s, we had a certain level of, of per capita income in the United States and a certain productive potential. If you look at that, and it was considered to be you know, a, a high time of American capitalism, if you look then and you look, say, in 1995, and you ask what happened, well, productivity went up by a tremendous amount. So there was a possible choice to make. The possible choice was we could work half as much as we worked in 1950. So instead of working a 40-hour week, we could work a 20-hour week. Or instead of working every month, we could work every other month, and so on. You can figure out for yourself. And we could have the same per capita output in 1995. Or we could decide to work as much or more and have a much bigger per capita output. Did any of you partake of that decision? No. Do you know anybody who partook of that decision? The interesting thing is, in a market system, nobody partook of that decision. The market propelled the result. It coerced the result without anybody ever addressing it. And yet, that's one of the biggest decisions that, I mean, what a huge decision, right? Forget that if we redistribute the wealth, we could not only have the same per capita wealth now, but we could have nice, desirable situations now and be working half as much. But it doesn't even come up. So that's what I mean by, does the allocation system make the, the issues at stake evident to everybody and give people the appropriate say over the issues at stake? So those are the kinds of norms that I think an anarchist would have approaching the question of allocation. Now, Participatory economics puts forward something called participatory planning as the purported solution to this problem. Is it? Well, I don't know. Not enough people have addressed it. Not enough people have thought hard about it. I think it is. You know, I think it weathers the storm of criticism, which so far has been pretty, not even a storm. Um, um, in fact, in any case, but will it? I don't know whether it will turn out to be a good answer. But if it isn't, the correct solution is to do better, not to choose between um, you know, the rock and the hard place, markets and central planning. What is the characteristic of, of participatory planning? It's really not, you know, the broad shell of it isn't very complicated. It's basically that all these various actors in the economy right, um, uh, negotiate the outcomes with each other. They propose what they want to do. They hear back others' reactions to what they've said they want to do. They modify what they are proposing in light of the information they get back. Um, it's going to sound simplistic. Now, you have to give this real meat. That's what I'm not going to do now. But if you give it real meat, very interesting things emerge. That it is possible for the exchange rates of things to reflect their true social costs and benefits rather than only the costs and benefits to just the buyer and seller. And other features. So... Let me give you just one example. Suppose we're a workplace. Suppose we were a, um, suppose we were a publishing house, since I know publishing houses, and down the road a piece there's a coal mine, and the coal miners have a proposal for an investment. And the investment is to do something to the coal mine. I don't know what, I don't know enough about coal mines, but it will have a dramatic effect on the quality of life of getting the coal out of the mine. Um, and let's just say that coal is still needed, so don't tell me that it's not, you know, just let's assume that it's still needed, right? Um, uh, and, and, uh, in the and in our workplace, we have a proposal for an investment, and it's an investment that would change the way we are able to function, some new technology, some new techniques, and it would make some difference in our quality of life. And the question arises, in a capitalist system, what is the interest of the two groups? Well, the interest of our group is to get our proposal through. The interest of their group is to get their proposal through. They don't give a shit about ours, and we don't give a shit about theirs, right? Forget capitalists. Let's take in a market socialist system so there's no capitalists. What about in a participatory economy? Well, to make a... Can anybody see right off? We have balanced job complexes, right? If we improve the situation in our workplace, what happens? Our average job complex for our workplace is a little better, 
right? But we have to have a balanced job complex over the whole society. So it turns out we're doing some things outside our workplace because ours is above average. Understand what I'm saying? When the dust clears, we wind up with the same average job complex as other people. Which innovation do we prefer having happen in the society? The one that improves the overall balance the best. Because we don't get ahead in competition, we get ahead by virtue of the, the whole social situation. So if the, if the coal mining innovation has a dramatic effect on all these coal workers, moving their quality of life a whole lot, it has more effect on the balanced job complex of the whole society than the smaller innovation in our workplace. And we actually have more of an interest in their innovation than we have in the one in our workplace. That's an unusual situation, right? It's a situation, in other words, there's empathy, there's solidarity, and there is mutual advance. The same thing grows, goes for income. Um, anyway, I, I, I will do more details if that's what people want when you ask questions, but if you have concerns about the basic values or some of the debates that I've had with, with anarchists about various of these issues and you want to pursue that, don't, don't hesitate. Anything is okay. Um, if it turns out that you know, everybody is quiet, I'll, I'll just enlarge the discussion so we fill up the hour. But I, I really do want to move to, because there are a lot of you who have already heard all this stuff, uh, so I want to move to discussion and see whether or not there are concerns. Yes, yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, in the three books, uh, yeah, so <laughs> there at three encounter, uh, uh, you've addressed uh, you break uh, um, participatory ec uh, economy into production, consumption, and allocation. Uh, but I I haven't found much of, in the way of the discussion on what I think is is equally important. That is innovation. Oh. Uh, and the idea of where are where's the quote unquote better mousetrap, the goods and services that we can't possibly imagine right now, but 10, 20 years from now, we won't be able to imagine living without. Just call it for a minute a product. Suppose we're a workplace. So one of the things we do is produce bicycles. Okay? Um, so, so that's one of our concerns. But another thing that we might do, we might see ourselves as doing, and that any rational and good economy is going to in fact do, is to say we want to not only produce bicycles but produce improvements in bicycles. Right? So, in other words, part of our concern is progress. Part of our concern is making bicycles more comfortable or making bicycles more safe or whatever it is. And if you take something else, obviously it becomes more... Right? So, it's basic, innovation is part of what an economy produces. And then you, that's why I mentioned investments. That's what investments are. They're, they're allocations of resources into innovations into making things better or trying to make things better. Um, they're just like anything else. Uh, and, and there are workers who do that kind of work. They do as part of their balanced job complex, research and, and exploration of people's needs and innovations and propose them and so on and so forth. And they have to... The difference is, is that now, if you have an idea for an innovation, the people you have to convince about it is investment bankers. right? And of course, their interest is profit and the maintenance of the conditions of profit. In a participatory economy, rather than the constraints on whether an innovation is pursued being, will it maintain profit rates and will it maintain the hierarchies that allow a few people to grab it all, right? the, the, the criteria becomes instead, will it better people's lives? Will it improve the overall balanced job complex? In other words, will it make work less onerous and more fulfilling? Will it improve uh, the quality of, out, of consumption goods? Will it improve people's incomes, the, the amount that they're able to, you know, to enjoy? The, those become the criteria. Or will it advance knowledge or musical pleasure and so on and so forth? I don't think there's a problem. I mean, I could be wrong in this. Okay, uh, can I, can I yeah. push you a little bit? Uh, it just, uh, well, uh, the example, of course, is a uh, uh, bicycle shop or, 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 or anything. And we're talking about, you know, uh, incremental improvements, and uh, that example is a, is, a, is a good one that's kind of like, you know, total quality management with all the, without all the nasty, you know, things that come about. But what about big more the, pardon me? What about big improvements? Well, yeah, well, you know, instead of a, a, a better bicycle, but, you know, where are the hovercrafts going to come from? Where are the, where are the flying saucers going to come from? Uh, or, or whatnot. I mean, where... I, Allocation I, I, of resources uh -huh. to 
the firm, the workplace, which is concerning itself with innovation at the level of transportation in the big, in the large. Think tanks, right? Whatever. It's not that different from now. The chain, that aspect, the, except that the change from now is the criteria of, of value, the criteria of worth, right? Not reproducing profit and the conditions of profit, not reproducing, you know, the, the relative... For instance, in the Soviet Union, why, why would Soviet planners opt for um, nuclear power over solar power? Not a simple question right off the bat. As compared to, in the U.S., there's various you know, drives and, and tendencies that are associated with profit making, but the Soviet Union doesn't have profit. But there are, there are investment decisions in the Soviet Union which also reproduce the class relation, the old Soviet Union, reproduce the class relations there. Monopolize information, right? Go, you understand what I'm saying? So in other words, there are lots of criteria that are associated with innovation, not just good stuff. The change in the economy from capitalism or market socialism and so on to participatory economics is that we still go for innovation. Why? Because we value it. We desire it. But now we remove all those bad motives and we impose positive motives. You know, you can have the workplace that's concerned with um, medical advance. It's just that instead of being concerned with medical advance that's, con that's consistent with the maintenance of the power of the AMA and the maintenance of the incomes of doc, and so on and so forth. Now it's medical advance that serves people's health. Well, I was going to ask something different, but he brought up an, an interesting topic, so I want to talk about his question, which is, in, in innovation, the, the places that you're going to see, the, or what I think see as the two sources of innovation, are either going to come from the people who are working on the assembly line or in the manufacturing, who know those improvements, but they don't ever have the opportunity to actually develop their ideas for how to improve things. Whereas if you had a balanced job complex, they would understand, because they're working on the assembly line, what needs to be improved, and they would have the, the freedom during their creative time to develop it. Or the other place that you see it is, you see a lot of, of innovation that comes out of, of labs. And a lot of those labs are based at universities. But and so there's a lot of creative ideas. It's a, a, a real spawning ground for it. But which ideas get developed, right? There's a lot of creative, wonderful ideas that could really help our lives that, that never get fostered or brought out of that because they aren't going to make anybody a product. Let me just, if you have an economy and the economy has slots, and the slots are such that 20% monopolize most information, skills, control, decision-making, and 80% are doing mostly rote, obedient work. What has to be the characteristic of your educational system? Well, it depends. If you think that 20% have the capacity to do this and 80% have no capacity, that would be one, then you'd give one answer. I doubt if anybody here thinks that. I hope not. If we don't think that, then, and it's not the case, then what the character of your educational system has to be is that it dumbs down 80%. It, it takes the capacity of 80%, and instead of expanding it and utilizing it, which would be a disaster for the economy, because now they would come into the economy with high confidence and high expectations, pissed, right? Instead, you have to, give, you have to, you have to put them through a torture rack which leaves them feeling that the only thing they're good for is rote and obedient labor. So why does innovation become improved in this system? One reason was the one I gave, and one reason is a variant on the one you're giving. It's because we get back the creative capacity of the 80%, and including the, the, the proximity to real, real situations and the different, the different criteria. This is really, I mean, if you just think about your own experience, when you were in high school, What's really going on? Well, you watch the clock at the end of the day. I mean, didn't you do that? Didn't you watch the clock? But sit there. Right? So you're learning to endure boredom. Right? <laughs> That's what schools teach, how to endure boredom. Right? You're learning to obey, which was worse, 10 points less on an exam or talking back to the teacher and differing. Well, I mean, get serious. You, you disobey. That's a disaster. You do a little worse or better on exams, no big deal. Right? Obedience, enduring boredom, unless, of course, you happen to get slotted into another sector of our educational system by whatever happenstance. Now you're learning how to be, A, callous, right, toward those beneath, and B, creative at some level. 
in some constrained way. I went to MIT. This was an institution which had a high premium because on, on actual competence, on, on training people to do things well with confidence. But there was another attribute of MIT. It isn't Harvard. So it wasn't training the ruling class. So they weren't buying you off. They weren't making you into, right? They had to make you amoral. It's the most sterile place you can imagine. And it's very important because, it, it, because MIT had to graduate people who were perfectly happy doing any interesting technological thing that somebody would pay for. So if somebody would pay them to, to go back a ways, create a gun that the Vietnamese could use to shoot down B-52s from a handgun, very interesting technological problem, they'd work on it. But on the other hand, if somebody would pay them to create a smart bomb, which they could drop from the planes, blow up dikes and dams, flood people, and kill you know, all sorts of innocent peasants on the ground, they would do that problem. Which, of course, were people going to pay for? Well, pretty obvious. In our economy, the people who have the money to pay are going to pay for the latter and not the former. That's, so you can see the dynamics of innovation. One kind happens, one kind doesn't. We get smart bombs for blowing up dikes. We don't get handguns for shooting down B-52s. We get transportation that, that, is, that doesn't empower people and doesn't redistribute power and wealth and income. We get it that's consistent with the maintenance of the conditions that we have. That doesn't mean we get no innovations. It just means we get narrowly constrained innovations. Uh, somebody in the back. Is there some women in the... I can't. My eyes. No. Well, uh, where? Yeah. Where was the person? Somebody speak up. I can barely see the hands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. It doesn't. We'll do one and then the other. Go ahead. Um, I guess I have two questions. Yeah. In a lot of your writing about remuneration, according effort and sacrifice, you often speak what seems to me in terms of like payment and um, in terms of of payment and payment, yeah. there's also like. A lot of the examples you use, there's monetary values, and yeah. I, my question is, in your vision of a participatory economy, would there be money? Well, first, let's ask what, what's really at stake here. Any economy produces a whole lot of stuff. Think of it as a gigantic pie, right? So now the question is, who gets the better cooked part, right? Who gets the quality pieces, and who, get, and who gets how much? That's the issue, right, with respect to remuneration. <laughs> Whether it's profit, which gives you huge chunks, or whether it's wages, which gives you small chunks, and, and the amount it gives you. So the money is, you don't have to think about that too much until you get into details. The real question is, by virtue of what I do, how much of the pie, how much of society's output do I get? Right? So when we say that people should be remunerated for their effort and sacrifice, we're saying you should get back what rewards you for your effort and sacrifice, and not something else. Right? So that's what's going on there. Money, money is the least important. I mean, you know, everybody thinks it's, a, it's, it's, it's just super, you know, it's behind the scenes. It's the social relations. It's the, it's the real material quantities that is the issue. Would a participatory economy use coins, use bills, right? It depends upon how good a technology and, you know, so on it has. Even our economy is getting away from that, right? Where people use credit cards and people use, right, use some kind of index, Right? That's what I think most of a participatory economy would use. But it's just not, the, the crucial question is, A, how much do you get and why? You know, what the, what, and B, are things properly priced? Right? Here's another factor regarding markets that most people don't talk about. Suppose, suppose you grow up in a ghetto in the United States. Which is it more sensible to desire? A basketball or a concert grand piano? You're five years old. In other words, piano lessons, forget the concert grand. Piano lessons or basketball lessons? Sorry. Basketball lessons, why? They're cheaper. No, let's say the piano lessons and the basketball lessons are the same price. It's just that the society's structure is such, as well as the cultural milieu and everything else, that you, you, that, you know, it's more likely that you will get more reward and more results from the basketball lessons than from the piano lessons because you're never likely to have your own piano. You're never likely to be able to afford it. Let me make the same point in a totally different way. Suppose you were to go and visit a, a penitentiary and you would go to the commissary in the penitentiary, right? And you would look at the goods there. How many of you think that you would see stuff there that was appealing to you? None. Okay, so we're agreed that the stuff that's in the penitentiary's 
commissary is not stuff that you would clamor to get. You wouldn't make much differentiation. You'd look at the whole array of stuff and you'd say, hey, and move on. Right? Now suppose you get arrested right? and you're in the penitentiary and it's six months later and you go into the commissary. Now what? Well, for some people would, would not do anything to themselves. And I mean that in some sense. They would continue to find it totally abhorrent. Very few people. And they would be miserable, even more miserable in the penitentiary than they might be if they remolded their, t- their taste and preference in terms of what's available. Right? So that their taste and preferences change to pay attention to the, the, the array of things that's available. In other words, we come to like what's, all, what's available. What the, what the marketeers tell us is that they deliver what we want. The reality is, we make ourselves want what they deliver. There's a million ways that you can see this. What do we want with respect to advertisements on TV? Hmm? Zero. Zero. None. And, and, and there are very few questions about which you can get a 100% answer. Right? But ask everybody in the United States, would you like to have zero advertisements on TV? Yes. Do markets deliver zero advertisements? No. Right? No. Suppose we actually ask people, the working class of the United States, 80% of the country, would you like to have more say over your life at work? Wages, jobs are delivered on a market, right? Does the market all of a sudden deliver more say because people would like more say? Of course not. What we do is we, 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 we are not idiots. We're not masochists. So we don't look at the array of things and say we don't like any of them and we'll be miserable. We refine our judgments so that we that we differentiate and we take among, so we take jobs. We take wage slave jobs, t- making choices among them, even though at some level they're all horrible. I actually first learned this from a guy at, uh, at, Am- at the University of Massachusetts, a guy named Herb Gintis. Um, this had a big effect on me, so I'll tell you when I was a student. He had this, it was like a poem. And in the poem was about economics and markets. By the way, his views now, a whole different story. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he, he said at the time, suppose you take a butterfly and you cut off its wing. Is it rational for the butterfly to walk? It wants to get from one side of the table to the other. And he said, is it rational for the butterfly to walk? No. Is it rational for the butterfly to walk? Yes. And what he was saying was, of course it's not rational for butterflies to walk. They should fly. Right? But if you cut off its wing, it's rational for it to walk rather than to just sit there. It's very important to understand. Well, that's why people make the choices that they make, right? All right. Anyway, another question. Way in the back. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you talked a little at the beginning about self-interest press and mm-hmm. how um, you know it's still sort of within the structure of this residue in this sort of broader economy. Um, so even in, a, in, in you know you see a, a model like that and, and you go, where's this leading us? And sort of say, I mean, I mean, ultimately, where where do we start? Where do we start working on something like this? Are there models out there already that, that you think are promising? Um, and and how, do we, how do we start getting us going? I, I think there's two issues. One is what we can call the South End Press issue, if you want, and there are other examples. <laughs> and the other is, let's call it the General Motors issue. So one issue is we can cry and create our own institutions. There's a lot of leeway in this society, a tremendous amount of wiggle room, if you want. Right? It's not easy because we don't have a lot of resources. But we can create a South End Press. We can create a Mondragon bookstore cafe um, um, in, in Vancouver. We can, I mean, there's, there's about 10 of them now, maybe a little less, right? We can create these institutions. And when we create these institutions, we can learn from, uh, fr- from our experiment, right? Now, we have to be very careful because what we're learning is what can people do who are trained all their life to work as wage slaves or as bosses? and who still have all the pressures on them to do that, and who are still working in a market system, and who still have to deal with banks and all the rest of it, what can they do? It turns out you can do quite a lot. Um, Witness some of the examples and how much they produce with how little resources. Uh, So that's one thing that we can do. Another thing that we can do is we can look at other institutions, other of our institutions, and we can say, just, I mean, take the example of the emergence of, of, the reemergence of feminism or the reemergence of racism on the agenda of the left 30 years ago. The same question could have been asked, and the same situation existed. We could create institutions that were feminist, really feminist, and that were really multicultural. That's like creating South End Press, which is really participatory economic, the best we can, 
right, within the milieu. We could also go to existing left institutions or progressive institutions and we could say, you know what, the degree of sexism and racism that you have internally, right, that you still embody in your structures is destructive. It's destructive to the people, which is enough reason, but it's also destructive because it says to blacks and women throughout the society, Latinos, it says, this is what the left would deliver to you. It talks a good line about these things, but look what happens when they set up their own institutions. You're still in the mailroom, right? You can say or you're still cleaning up. But let me just, so, so, so a second thing that could be done around race and gender was to say to existing institutions, clean up your act. Right? The third thing that could be done is that people could fight inside General Motors, not our institution, right? but they could fight in there for what? Reforms. Right? That is not a pejorative word. They could fight for changes right, that better the lot of people's lives, that make people's lives better, and that embody and move toward the values and structures that we aspire to, for non-reformist reforms, for reforms that piled one on top of another are empowering our constituencies and are moving toward our visions, if we have them, right, which would help if we did. So now, ask the same question about economics. We can set up our own institutions which are truly as good as we can make them in the milieu that we exist within, South End Press. We can go to the nation and say, why is your structure the same as Time Magazine's? Right? Why, if you're progressive, you, you don't think that you should have Jim Crow race relations inside the nation. You don't think that you should have male locker room sex relations and gender relations inside the nation. Why do you think that you should replicate Time Magazine inside the nation? We could do that. We don't, but we could. And we could fight inside General Motors for innovations there, or in the broad economy and with respect to budget. So all, all of those things exist. That's what, I mean, of course, you, you have to have a, you, if, you, if, you, if you agree with a particular vision, then you would organize your strategies and so on to win reforms that move in its direction. So the book Moving Forward that AK Press is selling is all about, it's partly about participatory economics, but it's partly about demands and movement organizing and structures that are consistent with trying to attain participatory economics. Um, in the back. Yeah, I actually read um, your book, or Thinking Forward, it was really good. Um, but I, I just want to really back, like, back up and highlight what you were saying initially about how we could go out and start our own institutions. But, um, I, I mean, I just I had a real like, visceral reaction to that when you said that, looking around this room. I mean, it's definitely a multiracial room, but it's a predominantly white room. And I think that it just really needs to be highlighted that going out and setting up our own institutions that are predominantly white, if we were to match the group in this room, um, is still not, it's sort of in a way hiding from the reality of what capitalism is really doing to our society. And I just really love what you were saying about the fact that reform to us on many levels is pejorative because we hate what the groups are that we're reforming are doing, essentially. But in the long run, or and you know, we a lot of us did start on third base, just racially in the United States, even in this room. So I think it's real critical to think about how we're working to bring power to the people that are the least empowered. But we shouldn't be immobilized by the fact that we're white either. We shouldn't be you know, because it's better to do something than not do something, even if it's imperfect, right? But let me let me say something that may not be so popular, um, which I think extrapolates from what you're saying. I know you don't mean that. I'm just some people will take it that way, and I don't want them to. Um, um, why do many sectors of the left get upset over the word reform? Um, rather than understand, I mean, what does it mean to get upset over the word reform? What is a reform? Reform is simply a change. There are about a million people, maybe seven and a half million people, who could die in the next four or five months in Afghanistan. If we were to win, which everyone here should have as certainly one significant part of their agenda, if not the priority part right now, because this is one of those very weird historical situations in which it's a very short-term phenomenon. Either we reverse this policy or it's a calamity, um, a, a, a humongous calamity. Um, but the, the, the point being that if we did reverse it, it would be a reform. Right? If we end a war, it's a reform. It's not a change in the whole international system which precludes all further wars. If we got rid of the IMF, it's a reform. If workers in General Motors or someplace win better wages or better conditions or more control, it's a reform. You can't be against that. If you're against that, you are not on the left. I mean that seriously. If you're against that, you're not even, you're callous. 
Right? I don't think people, when they come out, when they say they're against reforms, they have to understand what they're saying. I can't believe that they're saying, I'm against people's lives being improved. I'm against ending war. I'm against, I'm against, I'm against the civil rights movement, what it did. Right? I'm against all those things because it wasn't everything. Right? The, the, the real thing that we have to be for is reforms which are part of winning everything. Right? We have to be for them because they make people's lives better. And if we don't understand that, then we are callous. We are, will not be able to communicate with the people who are suffering those particular ills, right, if we denigrate eliminating those ills or reducing those ills. But what we have to do is try to win reforms in a manner which isn't a dead end, right, which doesn't ratify the existing situation and institutions, which instead builds movements that continue. This is no small thing, right? This was one of the biggest weaknesses of the 60s, right? that it built movements that ended with what was perceived to be the end of the problem that they were addressing, instead of building movements that did what? That developed a broader set of aspirations and that would move on to more and more encompassing goals. Um, that's what we need to do. So non-reformist reforms. <laughs>